we have now the last talk of, uh, uh, of uh, today. And uh, we have uh, the pleasure to present uh, our friend and colleague, uh, Pavel uh, Odinets, uh, who is a lecturer in uh, religious studies at the Karlstadt University uh, in Sweden. He holds a PhD in uh, Indology and uh, three uh, MA degrees in philosophy, history of religion and Indian philosophy and religion. His research interest covers the area of classical Indian philosophy in uh, Sanskrit, particularly, particularly uh, Advaita Vedanta and Kashmir Chinese modern Indian philosophy in English and Hindi, as well as uh, South Asian religions. He is uh, also interested in cross-cultural approach to philosophy as a way of life. Uh, Pavel is uh, the author of um, Engaging Advaita, conceptualizing liberating knowledge in the face of Western modernity, which was published in 2018. And um, uh, same year, rethinking Advaita within the colonial predicament, the confrontative philosophy of uh, K.C. Mata uh, Kavir. Uh, his uh, uh, talk is precisely posted on the Zotor philosophy as we well like around the globe, the case of Krishna Kandra Bhattacharya. I think and hope. I hope more than I think to have uh, pronounced uh, correctly. So thank you very much, Pavel, uh, and what is yours? Thank you very much. I would like to start first by thanking very much the organizer, Marta, Marta, thank you very much for organizing this event. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here and to talk and to share with you my thoughts about PWL, and as you say from the title, what is PWL? Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Uh, thank you. What will be the, the prospect of a PW, PWL, maybe with age or without, around the globe? And what I would like to do then is to. Well, that that, that will work. Yeah. Now, 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 okay. now, now, okay. And what I would like to do is to, to do that, to actually showcase it by looking at one particular ca case, and that is the case of Krishna Chandra Bhattacharya. So the theme of our conference to which I want to talk is, it's a question, what exactly is philosophy as a way of life? And what we are trying to see is what are the boundaries? What are the crossroads? What are the deadlocks? Yeah? So I want to talk this theme with the following aim. I, want to ch I would like to challenge the cultural boundaries of PWL. I would like um, then to speculate about the prospect for an intercultural approach to PWL. And I mean speculate because it's a working problem. Progress, how I see it. And I would like to show you then, to showcase how I see that it could be done by then got this show, to show that the prospect with one specific concrete example so that we, we get a clear picture how I see it. Uh, that is then the philosophy of the Indian Bengali philosopher, Krishna Chandra Bhattacharya. For those of you who are not aware of Indian philosophy, I'm just going to mention here that this is absolutely one of the key figures in the modern Indian philosophy, that is colonial Indian philosophy. So I'm discussing a major figure here and bringing it into discussion on PWL around the globe. Okay. My, my claim then, what is my claim? My claim is that KCB, so I don't, I don't have to say Krishna Chandra Bhattacharya, sorry, that KCB, as we used to say it in ideology circles, we just showed it, that KCB articulates a distinctive form of a PWL that entails both a, a meta philosophy, but a certain also historical, historiographical, historiographical approach classical Indian philosophy. And I think that both aspects are equally interesting. Okay, so I want to showcase how I see the prospects by looking at and claiming that actually what he's doing is both aspects. 
The parts of my presentation is, I, I divided it in four parts. The first one is then philosophy as a way of life around the globe, and particularly to focus on why, what I see, the big perils of this adventure. But I also want to show the prospects, what I believe are the prospects. The second move then is the case of Krishna Ch but, uh, Chandra Bhattacharya to showcase that prospects by looking how he's retrieving from within the colonial context, the classical Indian philosophy. Look at that. Next step, step number three, will be again to showcase the prospect, but then but, but looking at how he then defines the philosophy of self-knowledge on the analogy of the Vedantic banana. To unpack it for you, non-indologist, I guess, there is non-indologist here, yeah? And that will be the job to be done as soon as we will move around the world and to unpack things so that we can communicate. So I have to do that with three steps. First, show you shortly, briefly, what is Manana in the context of Advaita Vedanta, then move and see how Bhattacharya interprets Manana in the colonial context. And then third only, to show you then how philosophy of, how he conceived of philosophy of self-knowledge as a Manana. Yeah, so that's and that's our demo. And then finally, then I will have my conclu conclusion, which as you see, <laughs> it's a question mark. I wonder what do you think? What do we come to the conclusion? Is the philosophy the way of life in colonial India or not? And I will ask you always to justify if not, why, and if yes, why. Okay. So part one then, let us start then by looking at philosophy as a way of life around the globe, its perils and its prospects. And I want to begin that by looking actually at a book, the first primer we had of philosophy as a way of life published by Matthew Sharp and, and um, Michael Ur, 2021, yeah? where that this prospect is actually fleshed out. It's actually actualized in a primer. Yeah? So what we have there first is first section of the book where we see PWF presented as a meta philosophy. We have statements where uh, PWL as a, as a meta philosophy is abstracted from a God's work on Western philosophy. The Western is not explicitly said, but I, I take it to be. Then the authors present an analytical grid or a table of 10 recurring features in PWL. And they arrange them, yeah, those 10, in three levels. So there is a pedagogical, practical level that entails three of those things. There is a second one, which is a philosophical writing and communication, three of the next three things. And finally, there is a, a normative level, yeah? three things more. So you, you, you might say three, three, or three, so that's not 10, yeah? Well, there is one central one, which is the question is of internal interiorization, which as I read Matthew and Michael, they understand as a sine qua non. We don't have PWL if that one is not present. But now once, uh, once this is done, then they also discuss what is then the, um, the advantages yeah, of looking at Western history of philosophy through the eyes of PWL, through the analytical grid that they present and develop. And there are several state, interesting statements there, but I here take several. PWL's first is a multidimensional philosophical paradigm, which helps, according to Duarte Alpers, explain the fall where philosophy PWL is not any longer a predominant form of philosophy within the Western culture. So that paradigm, because it doesn't see PWS as a one monolithic block, but instead a, a con conglomerate of 10 different features. So that help us explain eh, things. So it's a, has an explanatory power. And then they move when those PWL presented as a meta philosophy and having this uh, the, presenting the clinic of these 10 features of it, then there is the question of P presenting PWL as a historiographical approach to, again, Western philosophy, which is what we read in the book about. Yeah? And there are several, again, the authors 
uh, highlight what is the relevance of doing that. And I think that those are very interesting for us all, yeah? That is, they, should, they allow us to appreciate, to highlight, to move into visibility, I think that the way you put it, yeah, certain neglected aspects of Western philosophy. So we, by applying this tree, this analytical tool, we gain certain understanding of our own past, Western philosophical past, because this grid allow us to. So that's one. And also another thing that is pointed out as a strength is that it allows for comparative historical forms of PWF. Um, uh, that is charting those same features and then seeing how different authors, how they map on the different authors and different periods helps for composition. So there is a, you could say that there is a comparative, clear comparative um, application of, of doing, working in this way. Now I want to read you the following statement uh, from the book. Drawing from a door at those who have worked in his way, the table isolates some 10 features of philosophical activity which PWL approach casts into visibility. Isolating these 10 numbered features of philosophical activity has allowed us to generate a series of discrete comparisons and contrasts between the meta, meta philosophies of the different figures and schools we analyze. So we are presented, this is the introduction of the book, we are then presented an idea of a PW as a meta philosophy, then as a historiographical approach, the tenets are presented, and then is the application. Now, let's go to the field and apply it to the different period of Western philosophy. Yeah? So here, I think I'm, I'm, I'm explaining you this because I want to show you the prospect and how it can be seen and actualized in the first primary we have. Now, so then moving from this prospect to what I see are the periods. What are the periods then in expanding or extending as it, as it is sometimes talked about, eh? the, the terms that it used is how to expand the, the framework of PWL to other non-Western philosophy. Well, I think that here I would say, I will call for caution. And what I will do is that, that well, I will say that we must learn from the past. What, what I mean here, but learning from the past. What I mean is that we in the West, we have asked the question whether there is or not, not PWA in India or in China, but we did ask the question for a long time, whether there is or not philosophy in India, China, Africa, and some answer has been yes, some answer has been no, but more important question is, I, I would like us to focus is how this was found out. What, where, how actually the, the answer was given? What made possible to give the answer positive or negative? Well, one pattern emerges, and I have to be very short here, but one pattern emerges here, and it is one specific notion of Western philosophy is regarded as a normative and used in determining whether there is or isn't philosophy in other cultures. If you want to, now I could not be more extensive on that, but if you want to raise up the best, well, I will understand the best account available on this exclusion of India from the history of philosophy, I, I'm really, <laughs> <laughs> I would, uh, please read India and Europe and say in, in philosophical understanding, I think it's chapter five on the exclusion of India from the history of philosophy. How the term, the terms, the Sanskrit terms that was taken into possibilities, why they were loaded, why those were selected and why not others, and how this was reflecting a certain conception of what philosophy is. So the only thing was to done is to go to another cultural context and see whether that thing is or not found there. Okay, so I think that we must learn from the past. That is, that is, this is how the question if there is philosophy in India or other cultures has been done and often that possibility has been denied. So I would rather say that when we will be talking about PWL, we should not run that same trajectory. Yeah? 
So admittedly, I would say that Sharp and Ur, uh, admittedly in that introduction, they, they, I, I think that it's very clear that the idea of PWL, as, as we have it now, has been distilled, yeah, has been abstracted from the main sources of Western theology. Now, the question then that we have, and I understand that's the main question we have before us, is when thinking about the global perspective, the global way of thinking philosophy the world life is, is it legitimate to apply this framework, this and others, this is not about the, 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 the feature of this thing, yeah? but whether this procedure is or not legitimate, yeah? to apply them in which in a normative fashion as a model to which we use them to assess whether there is or isn't such a thing. Okay, so my personal answer and from which I would like to stand and argue is no, no such kind of extension of applying the framework to other, or other philosophical traditions around the globe. No, not that. So my answer is no. Any future project of PWL around, and why not? Any future project of a PWL around the globe cannot ignore the lessons from, from looking at, P, at philosophy around the world, not PWL, just philosophy around the world. First, something that we came across, John, in your talk this morning, yeah? The politics of self-representation, what is philosophy, Western philosophy, when Westerner assess whether there is or isn't philosophy, say, in China or in Africa or in India. And the question of representing the other, the other being Indian, being African. One lesson. The another one is the question of cultural asymmetry that is reproduced in intercultural relations. If I come, of course, with a project where I will be measuring some other cultures with a model that I see in my culture and is part of my cultural identity, well, there is an asymmetry here, isn't it? We see that clearly, yeah? So I think that this lesson, which that, that's my real take, this lesson has to be learned for thinking PWL around the globe. So, what, but I'm not a negative here only. But this, I think, we have to consider. So, what is the prospect then? Well, I think that we, while we can start with a certain working definition of PWL, of PWL say the one that we have distilled from a dog. But again, working definition of a PWL as a metaphilosophy, but then it needs to be open, and I underline that as much as I can, stress that, to revise it in order to accommodate its different forms. So uh, we don't have an exhaust, we don't start with a exhaustive essentialist definition of PWL, no. We have always just a working definition and we are always open that the field will, will report back to transform and adapt the definition. See what I mean? So in another words, that I think that this is especially true since we have abstracted and distilled the PWL from the context of Western culture. So this is particularly true, that is the possibility of paying back when looking at the material, that the material will question and force us to redefine the concept. This is especially relevant when looking at non-Western philosophical traditions because so, Ado has done, and so many other scholars are doing it now, with the Western material. But how about the non-Western material? So, but, but the, it, it should then, I aim, I believe, the idea of philosophy um, as a way of life around the globe, it should aim at surveying the historical as well as a cultural form of PWL. Why? Paying attention to the similarities as well as specificities. So while it can be an anguish for the conception of PWL in the Western culture to see how the question of philosophy and, and religion is actually, this may be not a start in completely another context. 
And if that's the case, then I ask you, so what are the relevant questions from the other governments? See the point? Which I, I believe would so much enrich the way we think about it. It will set just a new agenda of questions. Okay, so that's my first part. How the way I, I believe we, there is a prospect, there is a parents, but there is also a prospect. So I move further and I would like to showcase that. Concrete, so it's not abstract but concrete. And I'm then looking to a, a rat colonial uh, philosopher, Indian philosopher, the Bengali Krishna Chandra Bhattacharya. The first move is to see how he saw the retrieving of classical Indian philosophy in colonial India. Now, while we are doing this, I, I would also um, ask you one, two questions. First, how, what, were, what was the cultural context when Ato was retrieving classical uh, Greco Roman philosophy? Because we, we see maybe contextual differences here. What are the context, the, the institutional, um, cultural context where Matthew Sharp is retrieving PWL in Western material? So now we sh let us showcase how this may be happening in a very different context, a colonial one. And what will mean the specificity of doing that, of that retrieval, which is still, I would believe, a PWL. You see what I mean? So I think that there are two leading questions here. First, when we then see how, ask the question, how Krishna Chandra Bhattacharya, his project of retrieving classical Indian philosophy. First, the question is, what is the, how he talk, what, how he answered the question, what is the present situation of Indian culture? Here, the sources that I will be using are the Swarajan ideas, and then the another question uh, is, what is the aim and methods for retrieving classical Indian philosophy? Here I will be using the sources I will be using is his studies in Vedantis from 1907 and Swaraj ideas. Okay, so we move that. What is then his way of assessing uh, the, the status of Indian culture in the colonial context? Well, in Swarajan ideas, is certainly a subversive piece of cultural criticism. It, this is just astonishing. Yeah? How? It, not a, a, um, a philosophical written piece, but it was actually a talk, which is also relevant for us here, yeah? which was a talk to students, to students in Bengal, in a public college in Bengal, and the talk he gave in 1930, just little to context, in Bengal, the question of, of political independence has been an issue here at least for 40, 50 years. So people have been discussing in this part of the world the question of achieving and how and the method and why achieving political independence, that was the hot issue. Now he is delivering a speech to the students in 1930, but he calls this Swarajan idea, just Swaraja translation, independence, self-rule in ideas, okay? So what we find in this talk is P KCB's assessment of the colonial predicament of, as he called it, modern Indian mind. And the diagnosis is cultural subjugation. I, I summarize, cult he says, that cultural subjugation is more, more dangerous than political because it is unconscious. Cultural subjugation, it says, entails a critical assimilation of ideas and values proceeding from another culture. When it comes to establishing a theology of this diagnosis, he talks about the language policies in colonial India, the imposition of the British education system, and the impact of Western political, social, and economic institution or India as the responsible of this state of affairs. A passage. We speak today of Swaraj or self determination in politics. Man's domination is felt in the most tangible form in the political sphere. There is, however, a subtler domination exercised in the sphere of ideas by one, by one culture on another, a domination all the more serious in the consequence because it is not ordinarily felt. Cultural subjugation is ordinarily of an unconscious character and it implies slavery from the very start. 
There is cultural subjugation only when one's own traditional cast of ideas and sentiments is superseded without comparison or competition by a new cast representing an alien culture which possesses one like a ghost. This subjugation is slavery of the spirit. Now, when it comes to describing the symptoms of, of this slavery of the spirit, it's just mind blowing when I read this for the first time. You imagine this saying to the students in the college 1930s. He talks about hybridization, much before Omibaba, mechanical adjustments. He talks about the Indian culture is a word that it entails habits of soulless thinking, that it is a mechanical thinking of the governing mind, that it is a shadow mind that only can imitate, that it lacks genuine creativeness and contribution to the culture and thoughts of the modern world. That was not subversive, then what is? We read a passage. A dream in this foreign language and in those Western institutions induced certain habits of soulless thinking, which appears like a real thing, springing as these ideas do from a rich and strong life, the life of the West. They induce in us a shadow mind that functions like a real mind, except in the matter of genuine creativeness. One would have expected after a century of contact with the vivifying ideas of the West that there should be a vigorous output of Indian contribution in a distinctive Indian style to the culture of thoughts of the modern world. See an agenda here. Yeah? Contribution especially in human subjects like history, philosophy, or literature. That is, he sees a very lamentable situation, cultural situation, and he says, hey, after this cultural relationship with the West, after a century, we should have produced something of our own assessments of Western systems of, of philosophy. We don't have that. What's happening? That's what he says. Now, let's move on. When it comes then to retrieving classical Indian philosophy, how he thought, he thought about the aims and the methods for doing that. So if we have to do, say, if a doll was retrieving uh, Greco-Roman philosophy, why? What was the aim of doing that? So the same, what was the aim for that, for KCB and the methods? There are three related questions here. Who is the subject of the retrieval? What is the aim and what is the pathway? When it comes to the who is the subject of the retrieval, no doubt that he understood that it is the Indian colonial subject, that it is the modern mind, the modern Indian, the Indian students of Vedanta, as he explains in these sources. What is the aim? No doubt. Swarajan ideas, yeah? It is an intellectual or cultural decolonialization and the restoration of a cultural continuity with South Asian past that he sees. Yeah? This is the job for philosophy that is uh, uh, ascribed. Yeah? And the pathway is confronting classical Indian philosophy with Western philosophy and assessing the latter from the standpoint of the former. So as you see, almost the other way around. <laughs> it's not assessing whether there is or not and how it looks. Indian philosophy, with a certain normative look, but the other way around. See, we are cast an eye upon. We are not casting him. Yeah? A passage. In philosophy, hardly anything has been written by a modern educated Indian that shows that he has achieved a synthesis of Indian thought with Western thought. There is nothing like a judgment of on Western system from the standpoint of Indian philosophy. And yet it is in philosophy that one could look for an effective contact between Eastern and Western ideas. The most prominent contribution of ancient India to the culture of the world is in the field of philosophy. And if the modern Indian mind is to philosophy at all to any purpose, it has to confront Eastern thought and Western thought with one another and attempt a synthesis or a rejected or, or a reason rejected for either if that were possible. 
It is in philosophy, is anywhere that the task of discovering the soul of India is imperative for the modern India. The task of achieving, if possible, the continuity of his old self with his present day self. He's putting a very clear project of what the intellectuals in India had to do when engaging with classical Indian thought. I hope we, we see that, yeah? Now, look, look at the method. Those are the aims. Now we go further. What are the methods? He reflections about the methods. Well, amazingly, he has he, he juxtaposes the historical and philosophical study or engagement with classical Indian thought or philosophy. I charted this out first and then I show you a passage, okay, when this is actually played out. Now, what we have is he sees two types of studies. One is the historical studies, and he juxtaposes them to the philosophical studies. And then there are several statements he makes which reveals how he sees the attitude of the narrator in both of these disciplines, the cultural identity of the narrator who is doing that, the attitude, the perils, and the portrayal of classical Indian philosophy that they actually call her as an answer. Yeah? So if you take the historical studies, the attitude is just, this is his words, I'm here very literal here, is that, is that of a mere and disengaged narrator. Whereas the philosophical studies is that of a sympathetic interpreter. The cultural identity of the narrator when it comes to historical studies is a Western historian of philosophy, typically an Indologist. And he was thinking here explicitly of George Thibault, an Indologist that produced an important translation of Sanskrit philosophical works. Yeah? So that's the, the cultural identity of the narrator. Uh, and philosophical studies, well, is Bhattacharya himself, what he, as he explains it, is the, the Indian student of Vedanta. The attitude for a historical study is that of objectification, whereas the attitude of the philosophical study displayed is aesthetic sympathy. The perils that he sees in both enterprises is, for the histori uh, historical study, is that it seeks to explain away is my parenthesis here, yeah? explain away philosophy and philosophical problems in terms of natural causes. This was actually the judgment we Westerners has passed on Indian philosophy. Its pessimism was due to um, the climate conditions of the country and political conditions of the country. So he's not speculating here. Whereas the philosophical study, the parents is anachronist, that is, as he says, reading one's own philosophical creed into the past. Now, the portrayal of classical Indian philosophy for the historical study is that it is a historical curiosity. Whereas, that's, I think, for us very relevant when we think about PWL, for a philosophical study, engaging with classical Indian thought, what then uh, uh, classical Indian philosophy is seen as a form of life to be regarded as a theme of literature of infinite interest to humanity, as he said, a recipe for the human soul. Passage. The historical study of a school of thought must have methods and aim different from those of philosophical study, though the studies are uh, mutually supplementary. The philosophical study should come first in order of time. The attitude of a main mere narrator has, in the case of the, of the historian of philosophy, to be exchange, exchange as far as possible for that of, of, the, of the sympathetic interpreter. There is the danger, no doubt, of too easily reading one's own philosophic creed into the history. But the opposite danger is more serious still. It is the danger of taking the philosophic type uh, studied as a historical curiosity rather than as a recipe for the human soul and of seeking to explain the curiosity by natural causes instead of seriously examining its merits as philosophy. This unfortunately is sometimes the defect of the Western expositions of Eastern philosophy and religion. We have heard of Indian pessimism and, uh, and fatalism from Spengler, composed of, uh, by a second, a second reference to the climatic and political conditions of the country. 
when history does sit in judgment on Indian philosophy, an Indian student of Vedanta may well be excused if to him a reproduction of the philosophy, such that it may bring it in contact with modern problems, appears far more important than any historical dissertation. See this point. So we see his reading of where is he doing his activity as a philosopher and what are the aims and what are the methods that he believes that has to be deployed. So now let's just look what I see. The next step is to see, well, let's see then how he showcases yeah, this in actual doing philosophy. How he defends uh, self knowledge on the analogy of the Vedantic Manam. Now, so the question, the question is, is how this agenda that I have just presented you in the colonial context, yeah, how he saw that agenda is actually fleshed out in Bhattacharya's own philosophy, so that we can see whether this is or not uh, P.W. Allen to which extent and in, in, on what basis we, we do the judgment. Yeah? Here actually is, <laughs> let's, let me explain, but uh, let me say first that what I will explain you now is history trial of Advaita, but there is more in his corpus. There are at least very important studies in studies in Samkhya, studies in yoga, and the Jaina theory of Anekanda, Anekandavada. Here, of the, of, in these papers, the long papers, we see how he actually actualizes this agenda. What I'm, what I'm going to do now is just look at how this agenda is fleshed out in his engagement with Advaita. The sources here are uh, from 1907, studies in Vedantis, his ma major book, and people usually regard it as the major work of Indian colonial philosophy, the subject as freedom, and um, the, third, the third piece, Advaita and its spiritual significance. What I'm going to do now is to summarize something that I have published in 2018, some most of the ideas. Something. My claim, the core claim then, how this is fleshed out. When we look at his major work, for many, the work of philosophy in colonial period, Bhattacharya formulates a new and special branch of philosophy by conceiving a philosophy of self-knowledge on the model of the Vedantic mana. Philosophical, and in this, by doing that, philosophical discourse here then becomes, is a necessary stage on the quest of self-knowledge to be attained in non-discursive intuition mediated through a specific uh, exercise of meditative introspection. This is core statement. I have sum tried to summarize it as clearly as I could, yeah? So let's see how he arrived there. Now, so the three steps. First, I have to explain you a bit what is manana in, in Vedanta context. The first time, uh, manana is used in Vedanta context is in a text called Brihadaranyaka Upanishads from roughly 500 BC. And it is a dialogue that Yagnavalkya has with his wife, Maitre. He says that he is about to retire to the forest and she is telling, can I follow you? So he says, no, no, you can have my properties and you don't follow me. But he says, will I achieve what is to be achieved? by the goods and properties is of no way. And then he tells her, Atmava are drashtavya, srotravyo, mantavyo, nidya sinavyo, maitre. Atmanova are darshanena, shravanena, matya, vidnya, vidnyana, idam sarvam, viditam. That is, you see, maitre, one should see and hear, think and meditate on the self, for by hearing and seeing and hearing, thinking and meditating on the self, all this world is known. So that's the first occurrence ever within the Vedanta context for the term manana. Now, the, the, this statement is important because it contains four future participles of necessity, 
which Jack also called gerundives. Those are forms of verbs, so like drish, to see, shru, to hear, man, to think, and the siderative form of the verb dial, to meditate. Now, I'm telling you this, what with the grammatics here, because that it is gerundives, participle was inserted, it's relevant because they point towards, they, uh, they signify actions that ought to be done. So ever since this statement, the Vedantic tradition has reflected here of how those different actions have to be done and in what order and what how they look like. Okay. Now, so we have a framework, in other words, of Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana, and Darshana. We do not have only one word, Manana. That word always occurs in a long, in a larger in a larger context of those four. Now, I could now show you several of those definitions, but I don't have time for that. So I show you one, which I have textual evidence that Bhattacharya was aware of and was commenting, and I'll show you later on how he was commenting on this very definition. This definition is taken from Vedanta Paribhaka by Dharma Raja, a South Indian, philosopher writing in the beginning of the 17th century. And he defines them as follows. In this way, hearing, thinking, and meditation are also means of knowing the self. Since in the Brahmana of Maitreyi, that's another word to say Vrihadaranyaka Upanishad, after mentioning seeing, that is, the self indeed is to be seen, there is an injunction, injunction that is those future participles of necessity, to hearing, thinking, and meditating. It, should, it is to be heard, thought, and meditated upon as means to that. Among them, now the definition, the mental act that is well disposed to ascertaining the non-dual Brahman as the purport of the Vedantas is called hearing, Shravana. The mental operation that yields cognitions con con consisting in tarka, the hypothetical reasoning, hypothetical analysis of how things may turn out when we consider a certain problem, which is well disposed to remove the doubts related to other evidences that hinder the meaning ascertained by the Vedantic world, that is called manam, thinking. The mental occupation that is well disposed to mental steadfastness, eh? having the self for its target or object, arta, the word is used, arta, which removes the mind from the other objects to which it is drawn by ill impressions without beginning, is called meditation, nididhyasana. Let me extract you so that we can operate with this. Manana is not an independent mental activity, nor an end in itself in the Vedanta, Vaita Vedanta framework. As a mental operation, mana, mental operation that is manasi vyapara, manasi kriya, an operation, a function of the mind, eh? the mass. As a mental operation, manana is an integral part of a larger, or larger framework, triple framework, Designated, uh, designating a gradual cognitive process in which it is preceded by the act of hearing the Vedantas, Vedantas here are the texts, the Upanishads, yeah? Shravana, and followed by intensive meditation, Nididhyasana, upon the self. That's always the point. This cognitive itinerary is goal oriented. It leads to seeing Darshana, and yeah? that equals. Hmm, to directly knowing Brahman or the self. As a, as a part of this cognitive process, manana is subordinated to the Vedantas in that its specific function is to defend the non-dual exegesis, their other exegesis of those texts, but that particular form of exegesis of those texts of the Vedantas by removing the doubts that arise from another means of knowing say, perception, the manas. Step two is to remember, step two. That's, that's shortly 
Manana within the Advaita Vedanta context. Next step, how Bhattacharya interprets that? We have in, in Advaita and its spiritual significance, takes place, takes place here in paragraph 14, he says as the following. The self is to be known, accepted in the first in instance in faith, in faith, which as confirmed, clarified, and formulated by reason, would be, would be inwardized into a vision. This work of reason is philosophy, which is thus not only an auxiliary discipline, but an integral part of the religion of Advaita. In this context, he's discussing Advaita as philosophy and as a religion, and its characteristic self-expression. That is, Bhattacharya clearly in this passage, first, remembers the definitions of Vyavnyavalkya to Maitreyi, you have to meditate, you have to heal yourself, and so on. This is clear, he's paraphrasing that, isn't it? And that's one. And the second, he clearly then, when, when explaining manana, he clearly conflates it with philosophy in this passage. So I take these statements to refer to the Brihadaranya Upanishad I showed you earlier, two for five, where then, and then accordingly, the self is to be accepted first in faith, and that's hearing. The self is then to be confirmed, clarified, formulated by reason, thinking, and that's manana, that's philosophy for Bhattacharya. And the self is then, after reflecting, after thinking, after philosophical discourse, if you want, I'm pushing it to this side, uh, it has to be inwardized, and that is in ideology, in, in neologism. But actually, it's a very nice play on the etymology of the word nididhyasana, which is a desiderative form, which is intensifying. The, the verbal root is dhyai, to meditate, like the word dhyana. We usually translate this as meditation. And here, instead of, he says inwardized, okay, because there is a prefix ni that kind of works as inside, as going inside, focusing, in, going inside of something. Yeah? So it's a creative neo neologism that tries to capture the, the, the meaning of the, of the term nididhyasana. Yeah? So the self then is to be inwardized into a vision, nididhyasana, and that is leading to seeing darshana or knowing directly the self. This he tells us in Advaita and its spiritual significance. Now, in studies in Vedantism, in, so that's his first work in 2000, in, uh, 1907, excuse me. There is an evidence that Bhattacharya is just explaining manana, referring to the, to the definition I showed you from Vedanta Paribhasha. And that's the only reason why I chose this one and not some other one. So that we can see how he interpreted this definition. And then in, in, then in that context, in 1907, he says, Manana is defined as the mental act which generates knowledge by means of arguments defining, uh, def defending the truth embodied in the text against objections pre uh, preferred by other evidences. Pramana. And this is literally Vedanta Paribhasha 9.3. Inference and other natural sources of knowledge cannot yield the sacred truth by only point to them. So proofs of the evident existence of God in European philosophy have sometimes been pronounced to be no proofs for the conclusion that necessarily transcends the premises. Inference and etc. of the means of knowledge, however, shows the direction along which one may proceed to the truth. They refute heretical objections. And by the, uh, retaining the thoughts about the truth, they enable the mind to get a tight grip, if you see in Ididhyasana in Wardizing, the tight grip of them and thus prepare the way for realizing them in ecstatic intuition. So you see the, 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 the program. Eh? So, um, Yes, yeah, so he's drawing here on Vedanta Paribhasa 9.23, and the question here is of inference and philosophical discourse, 
cannot literally prove the sacred, through the sacred, through, and here it is the, in the context of Advaita, it is the identity between Atman and Brahman, but if, epistemo, if the, epistemically meaningful in pointing towards them so that they can be realized in ecstatic intuition. Okay, so. I'm going toward the next last step. Now let's see then how this conception, so he, now his understanding of the Vedantic Manana, the previous two steps, how this is fleshed out in his major work, The Subject of Freedom from 1930. Okay? He tells us in that work, in, in, in paragraphs 15 and 16, that the foremost concern of the subject as freedom is to start a new and special, or has seen his terms, new and special branch of philosophy called, he called it, spiritual or transcendental psychology. And its aim is to justify, as he clearly explained that us in that work, to justify the prospect of self-knowledge by, and I unpack and summarize here, first, it must provide a critique of the of what Bhattacharya calls the objective attitude towards self and prospect of self-knowledge that he believes is displayed in explicitly identified sorts of skill, Kantian, Kantian transcendental philosophy, which he explicitly criticizes, metaphysics, and empirical psychology. I cannot go into the detail how each and every of these criticism is formulated. I will just formulate how in broad criticism is formulated. So the first job then of this new and special branch of study is to provide a criticism of these disciplines uh, saying that they, they display an objective attitude toward the self or the idea of self-knowledge. Step number two, the uh, transcendental psychology then is has to display instead a subject what he calls subjective attitude towards the self and the possibility of self-knowledge by providing a description of the grades or stages through which the subject is related to the object. This leads to the major theory that is fleshed out in this work on the three grades of subjectivity which each contains three sub-levels. So at the end, what we have is a theory, a, a theoretical construction of nine grades of subjectivity, yeah, through which the subject relates with the object. Now, the third step of the aim of this um, uh, transcendental psychology is the, the, to provide the description of the modalities in which the subject is related to the object is provided, and I underline that, for the shape of reverting them, those form of relating that the subject has to the object, the description, the theoretical description, the, the philosophical discourse that he displays in the subject of freedom is provided, as he explicitly says, in order to revert them by means of spiritual exercise that he calls in this work also, inwardization. And it sounds as uh, clearly how um, theory making and theorizing the grades of subjectivity leads to something else, to, to, to working upon, yeah? to using that theory, for example. Let me show you a, a clue passage where he criticizes them metaphysics, uh, empirical science, and here I don't have the one on Kant. I just didn't have that. Okay, I show you later on if somebody is interested. Uh, in the objective attitude, as displayed in metaphysics and empirical psychology, the knownness or feltness of the object appears positive, and knowing or feeling appears as its problematic negation. In the subjective attitude, the case is reversed. Freedom from the object is positively believed. Now you see the belief on the that the subject can be free from the from the object is first believed. Is positively believed, and the re relatedness of the object to the subject 
its objectivity appears as constructed, as not belonging to the object in the sense change belongs to it and is thus understood as the self-negation or the alienated show of the subject. So if you are thinking in terms of realism and idealism, this is profession of idealism, as he clearly explains in other parts of the subject. In the objective, objective attitude again, this or the object appears to exist beyond its thisness. This is his way of translating the Sanskrit terms, or relatedness to the subject, while in the subjective attitude, not only is the transcendence this rejected as meaningless, but thisness, meaning the so called psychological entities, knownness or feltness, appears also as not to be given as being distinct to introspection but to exist only as a distinct, as distinguished or constructed. This distinguishing or constructing being felt as less certain than the self-evident subject behind it. Yeah? So that's the criticism of the project of metaphysics um, um, empirical psychology and Kantian transcendental philosophy when it comes to self knowledge. So, what do we find then in the subject of freedom? What we find is the most part of the work is a thick description of these three levels of subjectivity that is, bodily subjectivity, psychic subjectivity, and spiritual subjectivity. But when he analyzes them, he distinguishes in each of those three sub levels, subset. So the bodily subjectivity he analyzes is first the body as externally perceived or observed, the body as internally perceived or felt. You think about phenomenology here? Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The uh, third subgrade is um, knowledge of absence as a present fact. I don't go into the days. When it goes to psychic subjectivity, it talks about image as undissociated from the idea. Next, idea as dissociated from the image. And next, non pictorial thought. He moved beyond, and then he discusses the spiritual subjectivity in terms of feeling, introspection, and even beyond the introspection. I'm not going to even try to unpack this, but I'm most important for me here is to show you two passages where my claim is this theoretical construction, which is the main part of the work, is not a, a theory for the sake of theory. And here is the passages, some of the passages. The modes of relating in which the subject relates to the object, the modes of relating are at the same time the modes of freeing from objectivity. So freeing the subject from objectivity. The forms of the spiritual discipline, that's freeing the subject from the object, the forms of the spiritual discipline by which it may be conceived, the outgoing reference to the object is turned backwards and the immediate knowledge of the I as content is realized in an ecstatic intuition. So theoretic descriptions of the mode in which the subject relates to the object is then to be reverted so that the I can be realized by um, introspection. Next passage. The elaboration of these stages of freedom in spiritual psychology would suggest the possibility of a consecutive method of realizing the subject as absolute freedom of any grades of subjectivity, or sorry, of any grades of objectifying the subject, yeah? um, or, or sorry, the elaboration of these stages of freedom in spiritual psychology would suggest the possibility of a consecutive method of realizing the subject as absolute freedom, of retracting the felt positive freedom towards the object into pure intuition of the self.
So last um, quotation from the same work, where he then clearly endorses that there is a need. This theory culminates into a need of a methods for self-knowledge. The cult of the subject, as it might be called, takes various forms, uh, but they all involve feeling of dissociation of the subject from the object, an awareness of the subject as what the object is not. The specific activity demanded is primarily in the inwardizing direction, and secondarily, if at all, in the direction of creating objective or social values. One demand among others, all being absolute demands, is that the subjective function being essentially the knowing of the object as distinct from it, this knowing, which is only believed and not known as fact, to be known as fact, as the self-evidencing reality of the subject itself. This would be the pull of the subject for excellence, yeah? a spiritual discipline of the theoretic reason, a method of cognitive inwardizing, the possibility of which, as indeed of any method of realization, is not ordinarily recognized. Just to uh, be clear also that why he endorses the need that the theory has to be followed by a process of introspection, if not in what his word is inwardizing. Yeah, he is very clear that Kant in passages, if you have the references, that Kant has denied the possibility of, of, of such a method and that it is absent from Hegelian philosophy. So he thought that that was not there in modern Western thought, and he thought that this was specifically Indian. See, remember his agenda yeah, for bringing what is specifically Indian to the thoughts of the world. Conclusion. Uh, right. okay. Two minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> Two minutes. I read them. Two minutes. Krishna Chandra Bhattacharya believed that modern Indian culture has been culturally subjugated. He thought that for the, for the modern Indian philosopher, philosophizing from within the colonial context went hand in hand in intellectual decolonization. From this perspective, he was uncomfortable with the prospect that a historicist engagement with classical Indian philosophy could provide. Instead, he endorsed the need for a philosophical appropriation of this past regarding classical Indian philosophy as a recipe for the human soul. This, he thought, was distinctively Indian, something that he thought was absent from modern Western thought. Three, to the extent that in his subject as freedom, it contains a philosophy of self-knowledge that was inspired by the Vedantic Manana. It entails an implicit epistemology of self-knowledge. Its five perspectives are belief in the, in the existence of the subject as different from the object, philosophic discourse, philosophical reasoning, rational eh, thinking, third, introspective meditation, and fourth, ecstatic intuition. This is mapped on Shravana, Manana, and Vidyasana leading to Darshan. Or, as a philosophy of self knowledge conceived on the model of the Vedantic Manana, transcendental psychology is not a display of a self sufficient philosophic discourse, nor an end in, an end in itself. It is instead an integral part of a largest prospect of self knowledge that falls partially outside of the limits of philosophy proper. Particularly, he talked about mysticism here. I didn't bring this up for today. It was too much for me. Five, in, in the last analysis, then, the purpose of the subject of freedom, freedom is not theoretical. It's not, but practical. That is, as a philosophical piece, the subject of freedom was intended to be read, I would say, almost provocatively, as a manual for introspective meditation that could lead the reader to her own attainment of self-knowledge in ecstatic intuition through a spiritual discipline of the theoretic reason, a method of cognitive humanizing, as he explained that. Yeah? So in transcendent, transcendental psychology, philosophic reflection of own self-knowledge begins with a belief in the subject's freedom from the object and a demand for knowing it in a modality of knowing without thinking. I skip the seven. On the whole, then, 
The subject of freedom contains an implicit metaphilosophy. The value of philosophic discourse is propedeutic in that it facilitates self-knowledge to be actualized by a subsequent spiritual exercise. Now, I know. Now, let, me, <laughs> let, let me finish, let me finish by a quotation by an Indologist. Now I show I showcase how I see PW around the world, how I think we can do that. Now I this is one case of Krishna Chandra Bhattacharya. Now I would like to read for you a piece in 1992, written in 1992, where an Indologist um, reflects upon the question of philosophy in other cultures. Listen to this. Huh? Until several decades ago, general history of philosophy. So I, I want that you take this and come back now to how I started. Until several decades ago, general histories of philosophy used to assure their readers that philosophy originated in Greece, that it has a genuinely and uniquely European phenomenon and that there was no philosophy in the true and full sense in India and other Orientals cultures. The Orientals, according to this view, did not pursue pure theory. So here you have the normative statement what philosophy is. Yeah? Therefore, there is not, not such a thing in, in other cultures. They did not seek the knowledge for the sake of knowledge, regardless of its practical or soteriological implication. I will see the point now. In their own way, Modern Indian writers, I hope that after this 45 minutes, read KCB and so many others. So this is just a beginning. And so many others, in their own way, modern Indian writers have accepted and echoed this assessment. However, from their angle, the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake appears as an evil curiosity, a useless academic enterprise. Meaningful knowledge has to serve a purpose. It has to be a means, sadhana in Sanskrit, towards an end. Accordingly, the fact that Indian philosophy does not advocate knowledge for the sake of knowledge, but instead proclaims its commitment to a spiritual and a soteriological purpose, appears to them, the modern Indian writer, as a fundamental strength. I think we just see how one of those was trying to say exactly this. Yeah? The, ultimate, the ultimate destination of philosophical inquiry should be then final liberation for those out of moksha from suffering, rebirth, rebirth, and other imperfections of worldly existence. So sorry. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Uh, Pavel, I'm afraid that the Indian philosophy uh, doesn't give us uh, uh, time for questioning, uh, but of course I, I ask uh, to the organizers, uh, well, I don't know if we have time, we have... Uh, well, well, no, okay, because I see that we are... We are uh, uh, okay, so uh, we have uh, time, of course, uh, uh, John Sellers. Albert. And me too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because I am. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So thank you so much for that. That was fascinating. And it was brilliant to see you really go into the details. That's exactly the sort of work that needs to be done, I think. So I really enjoyed that. Um, I've got a number of comments, but I'll leave it to just one, um, which brings us back to your opening thought about what philosophy as a way of life might look like from this global perspective. So when I was at a conference just a few weeks ago, when I, I read a, an earlier version of my paper, um, Graham Parks was there. Um, and he commented on the idea of philosophy as a way of life or self-cultivation. And he says, if we were grounding this concept from a Chinese or an Indian perspective, one thing that would really stand out that doesn't stand out in the Western tradition are physical exercises, physical practices. And so to go back to, to what I was saying in my talk this morning, whether it be Musonius Rufus or Ignatius Matleta, we talk of spiritual exercises which are contrasted with exercises of the body. 
And although we might be able to find a few things in the Western tradition that involve the body in some way, like vegetarianism, for instance, um, from a global perspective, it looks like physical practices would be much more prominent than if we have an exclusively Western perspective. Wonderful at all with the question. Thanks. No, no, yeah, yeah. So yeah, no, so just a comment really, but yeah, but yeah. be to hear your thoughts on it. Uh, 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 we, uh, we can collect all the all the, the, the answers. So how <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, it was very, very stimulating, very instructive. And I found your reflection at the beginning, this first part, very uh, uh, thought provoking. And uh, one, one of the aspects I was thinking about, so uh, I found I found very, a very interesting approach, a very promising approach that you're starting with an overworking definition of uh, philosophy as a way of life and then redefine it. But I was wondering, if following this method, we may come to a point where we decide to abdicate from the word philosophy uh, at all. So that we would see that there is some affinity between what we call philosophy uh, in the Western world and uh, what is being done in other cultures. But perhaps there's a better word to describe it. And when we use philosophy, we are imposing already some aspects of Western way of conceiving it that perhaps shouldn't be in the general model. So I'm wondering if this is a question you face or other people working in the same field face. So uh, I noticed that most of the quotes that you gave, the word philosophy does not appear, but then in your explanation of it, you possibly use philosophy. So there could be this argument that we should perhaps criticize the word this Western world, or the context from which it comes from. So uh, I was wondering if you could also think it this way. I can point. Okay. No, no, no. No, you. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sure. Very good. Thank you. Well, but no, it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, okay. No. Very, very important uh, and fascinating. So, very good. Uh, my question is about the uh, political uh, perspective of this discourse, because uh, you uh, beginning with the independence moment and with the uh, so the decolonization, etc., and then all these. Uh, um, uh, way philosophy as way of life in Indian perspective uh, appears uh, a little individual in the sense that there is a, an individual exercise. So I uh, this is a, a question, the first question. And then we have in the, in the, uh, in the West, uh, so the, 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 the Marxist uh, perspective that have uh, helped us to, um, uh, to construct a collective political perspective as a, a rejected subjugation. You know? But from this perspective, the subjugation appears not only a material and economical uh, problem, in what sense these uh, philosophy of, uh, of way of life can help you, help us to um, redefine, redefine, redefine a political perspective and as a collective. Thank you. Uh, so. So, okay, uh, um, uh, just uh, one uh, so last uh, question by me. Well, um, but it's, it's really uh, well, a, a big question. I, uh, I, I, I think that the, the, the problem for me is that, that uh, if we are not uh, at the opposite, uh, a bit Eurocentric in uh, projecting on uh, uh, something that is uh, not born, uh, simply 
uh, with the, the same characteristic of uh, uh, philosophy uh, is that uh, if we take it uh, as a, a technique of life, you know, that is born to you know, in uh, in uh, with the same with the peculiar characteristics. You now uh, we are not eurocentric. If we if we project this technique of life uh, on techniques of life uh, that. Uh, have a name. Uh, for instance, you say the philosophy of the new title, philosophy uh, of self knowledge as manana. But why? We have the two, uh, we could compare, of course. We have the two techniques of life, no? Um, a, philo a philosophical one and a manana's one. But why we have the two name uh, manana as philosophy? And I speak uh, by a point of view. No, in, uh, I remember that uh, in the Italian, at least, uh, history of all philosophy, Real uh, Antisari uh, Bagnano, there is a, a first chapter dedicated to the Indian and Oriental thoughts. Okay, uh, uh, why we have uh, uh, to, to speak about uh, philosophy? It is not in the sense that. Uh, a real egocentric projection on other words. Thank you. Thank you. Do I go one by one? First, the question on the physical is that when it is true that if we are going to turn our attention to India, you will find all sorts of exercises that we will not have, we will it will be not easy to even, you know box them in terms of body and say soul or mind. Because for example, manas, which always translated as mind, man to think, yeah. Uh, but in the context of Advaita, it's called um, uh, Jagapadatta. Uh, it's a non-conscious entity. So in this system, mind is a non-conscious entity. So when we say that manana is a, function of the mind, it's not the function of consciousness. Is the function of the mind conceived? So here, even the question of bodily practice, mental practice will, will have to be bracketed a little bit and say this question of body, mind, and so forth. This, well, the dualist or tripartite and the poly, you know, we will have to bracket a little bit and think more how they are classifying them, yeah? Certainly, I don't know if that's what you are thinking. If I do thinking in yoga here in this context, yeah, I, I thought that maybe you are thinking about that. Well, if we will then look at the historical data, for example, in the Patanjala Yoga Sutra, the, the definition of yoga, yeah? And the place for the asanas, that is, or the bodily posture, is, if not known, reduced to the minimum. That is, yoga is defined as chitta vritti niroda. Yoga is the cessation, the complete stop of the function of the mind style. That's what yoga is. It's not the performance of the bodily postures. Now, if you look in a broader context of Indian culture, yes, it is true that that history develops then different practices that relates to bodily practices, but also all sorts of practices that then entail the body of physical bodily substances, just to provoke you, the consumption of sperma, so that we are all provoked. <laughs> so, but I want to mention that, so that what we see that, that it is not really so easy to map even, okay, those are bodily practices or those are mental practices, it will be more complex and we will have to look how they have addressed it and then eventually how it, this can pay for us, what this can mean for us. So this job, this, this, this job, yeah? yeah? But we will have to look into these histories. Yeah? That's okay. Yeah. Next question, Heather. The question of the use of the term philosophy. You are absolutely right. You are going to be charged. And as you, me, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you. That is, if you are thinking about PWL around the globe, you have to accept that you will be drawn out of your comfort zone. 
And words may not necessarily longer have the meanings that you have been attaching to them. One of those is philosophy. Another one is religion, as we have discussed. Yeah? Yeah. We have discussed now, uh, we, we thought them to be phenomena in the world. But philology thinks before phenomena in the world, words and their history, his, history of the meanings of the words. Yeah? So oh, your question was whether we working in the field have the problem is in applying this word. Uh, this is the ABC of teaching any Asian stuff for students. We use them teaching philosophy, religion. We, so we talk about, for example, let's say Taoism that is philosophical or that is religious on the ABC introduction to Taoism is to make this distinction. <laughs> but you see, it's about, so I'm, I'm here I want to be serious. It is about our use of the words. It is about how we use words and which meaning we are ascribing to those words. And it is when we are going to other cultures yeah, and meet realities that don't fit exactly the way we have been using certain words, what do we do? Do we exclude them? Or are we ready to extend the meaning of the words as we are acquainted with them? But so there is uncomfort zone because, and so your question at the end, you said, should we throw away the, the words philosophy? No, but we should be working towards redefining them. Isn't PWL, it's all about that, yeah? You can say that it's just rethinking the meaning of the word philosophy from a strictly philological two, um, three, the question of politics. Yes, question of politics and collective and, and the, the, the tension between collective and individual. I totally agree with you. What I mean here, what, in this diagram here, what I mean is that we have a working definition of PWL, and then we look and explore the cultural and historical faults. What I mean is that, so when we look in the colonial period in India, how that, is it PWL? I had a still a question mark. <laughs> but we will see how the context certainly was there to make it politically loaded. That is, whether you can do a PWL that is not politically loaded nowadays, I don't know. But in colonial India, what I showed you is that there was no way. And the last, what I wanted to show you with the last Paragraph is that the indulgence was saying in 91, well, this is the prospects of so many modern Indian thinkers. That is the, the, the political dimension of how they thought of the classics was the defining force. So the, what why we call it the cultural and historical form, this Indian philosophy and in its particular period. For the period, this is maybe not relevant. But in that period, yes. Now the question on the on the tension between the collective and individual. Look, in another conference, I def I, I engaged with this philosopher in other sources, defining that he what he did, he had a too tired, too tired, and not pronouncing it well, and a project of independence of of disengaging. One was on the level of transcendental philosophy. You have to abstract and know the self as this engaged, independent from objectivity. On the other hand, this goes that, so that you may call an individual pursuit. On the other hand, as we saw in the Swarajan ideas, this was also about achieving a cultural independence, not for him, but for, for the entire population. Yeah? So here, I believe, yeah, here was going hand to it was too tired. Program of independence yeah? on the uh, on the uh, as I called it in that context on the flesh and body Indian and on the level of transcendental subjectivity. Yeah? That's the level of But I agree with you, and I would say so. Paying attention just so that we see the case showcasing KCB in context of the discussion, so we see how this may be fleshed out in the colonial India, how the needs 
for intellectual decolonization is actually prompting them to look at the classical Indian thought in a different way as a recipe for the soul. Not him only, the only the collective enterprise, the, all the modern Indian market. So I agree with you. Yours. Why the last, this was the last one, yes. Uh, why philosophy, uh, Manana as philosophy? See, my point was here is that as he was prompted, as he, by the colonial situation, and as he saw that that situation give rise to a very lamentable situation of his culture, what he thought is that he has to turn around back into history and look retrieve and construct, if you want, Indian philosophy as a classic, just a really the classic, and we look for inspiration for addressing present moment. That, that's what I thought he was inventing. Yeah. Now, while doing that, then the particular case is so he then and this wanted to um, propose yeah, a project and legitimize, as he said, yeah, the, the prospect for a philosophy of self-knowledge, which he thought was denied by Kant. Kant said that there is no intuition of the of the subject, therefore there is none. Yeah. So he 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 he, um, he thinks that that's not allowed in transcendental Kantian philosophy. So what I what I see in the classics in that Vata is a certain way of understanding what I will take to be philosophy skills that is we doing the identification, yeah, and then depend a philosophy of self knowledge. But then why I say that it is on the analogy of Manana. Because it is inspired on the idea that self knowledge, as theorized, is only a part of a larger commitment that way um, exceeds the, the, the part, if you want, ascribed to philosophy. Yeah? Philosophy is part of that. So, in other words, the, uh, the, the use of philosophical reasoning is part of the quest of self knowledge, but it's not there. It doesn't take it, it, it doesn't exhaust. In self knowledge, we can, we can encounter this, this, and the manana, and the something other. And maybe or, or many techniques. Yes. yes. Yeah. So what he does is I look to the Indian classical past. I see a Vaita, I see the framework of Shravana Manana and Yasana. I see how he conceived Manana, how they conceived Mananaki as a, um, a rationalization and um, um, discussion, eh? um, a rational discussion about each philosophical issues, and particularly applied to the question of self-knowledge. And then he believes that in the colonial India, he can propose a philosophy of self-knowledge that is inspired from that. So he, again, he tries really to actualize right. a, a, a vita as recipe for the soul. <laughs> yeah, and ju just to, to be clear here, I'm not saying you any a vita, not at all in his career, and then engage with other and have different takes on it. So it's not that we have here a sponge of uh, writings that, you know, anything else. No, no, this is part of what he was doing. But in this move, he was inspired of rereading, but also rereading here and actualizing his in colonial context, the notion of Manana. Yeah? Thank you, uh, Pavel. Thank you very much.